You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Infinite diversity. long and prosper and welcome to infinite diversity a star trek universe podcast here on the bqn podcast collective i'm your host for today chrissy and joining me is my co-host thad thad how are you doing today <laughs> let me get the universal translator going <laughs> so i can understand that <laughs> you gotta assume i said something in rhyme i guess yeah uh. yeah <laughs> All right, and also joining us today is Chris from First Flight Pod. Chris, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm really thirsty. Um, good <laughs> to come here, but I'm grateful to be asked to come on this podcast, talk about whistle speak. Yes, all right, cool. And before we jump into our topic for the day, we'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon patrons who make this show possible, particularly our associate producer, Carl Wonders. Listeners, you can hear your name listed as one of our associate producers for a monthly subscription of just $10 at patreon.com slash BQN. And with a monthly Patreon subscription of just $5, you can join our BQN Star Trek script table reads. Watch your Patreon messages for information on this and other fun opportunities with your collective. They did one of those last night. By the time this comes out, I think it'll be out. It was Cupid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fun. So I was like, ah, oh, I kind of wanted to be in on that, but you know, didn't, couldn't do it this time around. All right. Well, um, don't really have any specific Star Trek news, uh, but the CEO of Paramount, Bob Backish, uh, is out as of this week. So, yeah. uh, you know, maybe they'll bring in somebody who thinks that we should have more lower decks. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Paul Backish is out of the CEO. Currently, there are three people running as a conglomerate interim CEO. Chris McCarthy, George Cheeks, and Brian Robbins. I, I am not someone who is super ear to the ground on the business end of things, so I couldn't tell you a thing about any of those people. But, <laughs> yeah, and in the meantime, the possible sale of paramount is still a possibility out there uh at the end of uh the um the exclusivity window that they had with skydance for for uh to reach an agreement for a sale ends at the end of this week i believe and uh apollo capital who i think we've talked about already about doing this uh has uh joined forces with sony to uh to give an all cash offer to buy Paramount, which could be interesting. Uh, for yeah. me personally, Apollo, being a large uh, private equity company that owns many companies, they also own my employer. So, <laughs> I mean, if this is how I get on Star Trek, okay. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. All right. You're going to have an in that none of the rest <laughs> of us guess. do. <laughs> remember us small people when you get up there <laughs> All right, to the high right. summit mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. well hopefully whatever happens it's it means good news for more star trek that's really yeah, all i can say i think regardless of how the sale goes i think we're still gonna get more star trek i i don't see anyone purchasing paramount and saying hey let's see about uh canceling your most profitable ips because mm -hmm. you know we want you to lose more money mm -hmm. i i just don't see i we're gonna get more star trek uh because it's one of paramount's tried and true brands uh mm -hmm. it's it's not going anywhere it's what a signature brand, right? We, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like half of Paramount Plus is being held up by Star Trek people who watch Star Trek at least once a week or something. I don't something remember what the like numbers that, yeah. were from a few weeks ago, but 
It was definitely. I want to say it was like something like twenty or thirty percent of all Paramount Plus subscribers watched Star Trek, and so and and it was a really high percentage of Paramount Plus subscribers who watch Star Trek also watch other Star Trek. Yeah. Which makes perfect sense. Which yeah, you can't just watch surprise. One. You got to open uh, your yeah, bag of chips. How? And... What's this how once many... a week thing too? Like what? It was a minimum. A how many people minimum. do you? <laughs> Do you know that have only ever watched one Star Trek series? Like none um, under the age of sixty. On Paramount Plus. <laughs> I'm not talking about the people who watched TOS in the sixties. Yes, well, my go. sister only watched Picard season three. That was it. Interesting. Hmm. She's very, very super casual. Like we grew up watching TNG, but mostly Voyager. And she watched season three of Picard. Just from nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. um, she went back and walked pre um, Preemptive Strike because I told her to before a certain episode. Well, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so maybe there's people like that out there. Oh, but yeah, I bet if she's a Voyager fan, she probably sometimes watches Voyager. Yeah, there you go. Oh, no. No, my parents will do that sometimes. Yeah, but. There you go. Okay, fair enough. Very fair casual. <laughs> All right. Well, so that's that's it on the the news for this week. Uh, so let's. Yeah, we still don't have Nielsen numbers. I don't think. <laughs> we won't until the season's over. Hey, it seems I mean, like at this point. The only thing we can I can say is, when Paramount gets sold, it means they can actually greenlight new things. Like they can't greenlight right. anything right now. That's why we're not mm -hmm. going to get Legacy or anything like that. Mm -hmm until it's sold so let's go this is true yeah uh, i just checked the nielsen's um this isn't super great uh uh they do have for the the first week of april and star trek discovery is not on it Ooh. okay which considering that we got two episodes that week is not great no because it's based on number of minutes of a show watched. And now, admittedly, there were people that did not watch it in the first... In Seven the first days. three, three days. days of yeah. it. Be, well, three days in this case, because it's yeah. April 1st through 7th. Right. So, it may very well make it for next, for the following week. But mm -hmm. this is a period where, we got, where, where the season premiered with two episodes. So, yeah. I would say that it's probably not looking great for discovery well Gee, but are they advertising yeah. outside of paramount right i mean right, paramount right. plus you get your advertisement but outside of that what are they doing yeah that's fair uh i i saw advertisements for picard and strange new worlds mm -hmm. in the real world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know if i can't recall a discovery advertisement or a billboard or anything no. like that not for this season no it used to, used to be for for a quite a long period uh I think they finally took it down, but my local Walmart for, I'd say it was probably a year or more, had a giant, had a giant poster of Captain Pike right inside the front door because nice. Walmart has a parent has a deal with Paramount Plus for like you can get yeah subscribe to it for like a discounted rate or something if you're a Walmart, uh, whatever Walmart's like the membership thing. program thing is mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Too bad you couldn't get them to give that to you. Even cool. I know, right? <laughs> uh, all right. So, whistle speak. I'm not going to try to whistle. Um, but there, there you go. There, there you go. we Th go. Thank you, Compere Chris. Um, <laughs> we start out with the uh, the vial. That's the clue, and it is uh, apparently just filled with water. And I didn't ask first impressions, Chris. What was your uh, your first thoughts, initial thoughts on this episode? Oh, it felt like a great episode of season one through five, Stargate SG-1. That, that was my first initial reaction. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah, Absolutely. They're, I can see they're that. in the woods. Of, they're in Canadian woods, running around, talking mm -hmm. about false gods, um, competing in some kind of trials to unlock an ancient technology. <laughs> right. I hadn't even considered that, but absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, of course it would be Daniel instead of Tilly. Mm hmm <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I like the episode. It's not like top 10 Star Trek, but it's just like good workman Star Trek episode. No, very classic. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, it would be, it would have been Dan- Daniel and Sam starting out, and then Sam would have been the one that went off to look at the, the moss. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Interesting. <laughs> Whereas uh, Jack would have been at the finish line, just saying snarky things. Yep, yep, yep. And with a big old bottle of water. And Teal mm-hmm. would be disqualified because he has Junior. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta rewatch Stargate. Okay, um, me too. Yeah. So, Thad, first impressions on that. Other than I love this episode. Me too. I love when Star Trek. Uh, first off, I love when Star Trek is just like screw the Prime Directive because I have long <laughs> been of the opinion that the Prime Directive yeah. is total BS. And <laughs> well, we can have that discussion I... another time. But yeah. <laughs> oh, I think we have had that discussion. Uh, yeah, before. we have. <laughs> but yeah, it and I I love when they have to deal with a a society and their beliefs and try to try to actually like respect those beliefs and work with them but also accomplish their goals, which as Chris was saying feels very Stargate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although SG1's like prime directive what? Oh yeah, well, God, yeah, you're false. That's... Well, in SG1's case, the Prime Directive wouldn't apply in any for any yeah. of these people because None of it. we want your because technology. The ghoul, because they came from Earth, the ghoul mm-hmm. yeah. transplanted these people to different planets. But also, that's why the Prime Directive doesn't apply in this episode either, because the the Denobulan scientists who made those towers already changed the natural yep. flow of their of yeah. their development there so, has already been shenanigans yes yeah they would all be dead mm-hmm. yes centuries ago right mm-hmm. 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 which is why the prime directive is bs because you should not le- use the argument that you can't interfere with a society as a rationale for letting them die but i like the prime directive as a piece of creating tension right yes for our characters to think through something and i do agree that in general the prime directive should mean that you should not be able to tell any other society what they should and should not do yes yes yeah but the usage of it to and i think the the show is telling us this is telling us that it agrees with me in that it's (laughs) basically showing that michael is like yeah well the prime directive shrine directive we're gonna do this <laughs> yeah yeah i mean think of kaminar like discovery mm-hmm. does these mm-hmm. major things all the time yep and uh the i've forgotten the planet but in new eden yeah uh, well that would didn't uh, count mm-hmm. though that shouldn't have counted because it was human. it shouldn't have yeah. but they were all saying it did uh, i know Pike is just like now nah, i'm gonna show this guy anyway because he understood that it shouldn't have counted mm-hmm it really shouldn't have. They were from Earth. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So we have the, the vial with the distilled water. Uh, uh, Burnham makes some suggestions about looking up historical things and anthropological things, because this is going to be a Burnham is the anthropologist episode. Uh, you can and take then... the Zeno out of an anthropologist, but you can't the, take the... Oh, yeah, wait, I lost I that. Lost I love that. <laughs> I love that. Because I have I have started sentences like that describing myself like i you know you can take the bookseller out of the bookstore but you can't take the uh. book out of the, what <laughs> yeah because it never works there's like two things that works with but so uh so i love that yes um but she finds out from kovich who has a um as my graduate advisor called it an office supply fetish because he likes real paper <laughs> yeah <laughs> Which I think is awesome. Um, real dead tree paper, too, from the 21st century. Uh, mm-hmm. So he's got the list of scientists, but he tells Burnham that Mall and Locke, looking for Mall and Locke, has been taken over by the Lockerer, which I'm sure is supposed to be a reference to someone or something that I did not look up. Yes, we, I think we, we talked about this in a previous episode. Oh, we that did, was, um, yes. The camera operator, I think? Yes. It's also a German Catholic theologian from the sem- from 1790. <laughs> There's religious aspects cool. in this episode, but I doubt that's what it is. Referring I, I, to. Yeah, that 
<laughs> we get a lot yeah, of German so was, uh, Catholics uh, and in I'm that sorry, era. It was, uh, okay. Yeah, it was J.P. Locker, cinematographer. Okay. Uh, so I was... I mean, close. I suppose a cinematographer and a camera operator are Related. more or less the same thing, but mm. at the same time, cinematographer is the official <laughs> job title, yeah. and I'm sure I just made the cinematographers who listen to us very mad, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Please feel free to correct us. It was not intentional. Feel free to explain <laughs> the difference between cinematography and ca and camera operation. Yes. I assume one is the cinematographer actually decides where the camera goes and the camera operator does what they tell them. But that makes sense. So, yes, so yeah, JP so Walker, have... cinematographer. Uh, and yes, uh, the, the ship is na was named for him because it first showed up in the episode that was dedicated to him. That's right. Oh, okay. So, well, go, um, can I go back to the vial for a second? Yo, please. Yeah, absolutely. My critique is I wish we clearly saw the scratch marks on it. Yeah, I mm -hmm. went back to that so many times. Mm -hmm. Where are the scratch marks? Like, where's the clue? I know they said it was slightly damaged. But we mm -hmm. never saw the scratch marks. It's like you kind of get a slight glimpse of it as it's going past. And that's it. But I do love the TNG style methodical just logicking. It reminds me of like mm -hmm. Data and Troy figuring out what Darmok is, right? They're just thinking mm -hmm. through it with the computer, yes. doing research. And that's it's not flashy. There's no shortcuts, as Michael said. They're just logicking their way through a problem and i don't know that's something that makes me very happy in star trek mm -hmm. i could watch mm -hmm. scenes like this all day yeah. all day yeah yep um, in a boardroom even better yeah with a powerpoint <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> uh all right so we have um he gives us a list of scientists we knew janelle bix of course we knew carmen cho of course um we're about to know here hit creel and we knew Valak. I don't think Derek's gets actually uh, introduced or talked about in this episode at all. I like that the Betazoid's name is Marina. Yeah, yes, isn't that, that nice? is <laughs> obviously a reference to Marina Sirtis, the actress who plays the most notable Betazoid in Star Trek. Yeah. Yes. Though not the most flamboyant. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So, all right. I feel so, like naming the Betazoid Major would have been a little too on the nose. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just being... Marina Major. <laughs> yeah. It would be M-A apostrophe capital J-E-L. <laughs> that, would, that would have been good. Then. All right. So then we, uh, then we go to Culber, um, who is talking to his grandmother. And I had a... I, I had a moment where I forgot that they were in the 32nd century. Same. Me too. Because I was like, oh, that's nice. He called his... Wait. <laughs> so, this, for some reason, didn't occur to me until I read the Trek Core review. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the holographic grandma from his head know the secret about the food? Mm. If he didn't know. Maybe he did know and he was testing to see how the Matrix was running. Mm, okay, okay. I Maybe. Or or maybe like his subconscious he always knew but didn't really. I don't understand how any of that. I mean, he says, he says, oh, this is just like my grandmother. Well, of course it is. You programmed it. Right. Well, you know, I think his well, assumption is that he didn't program it. It just read his. It's his, AI his... reading his mind about his okay. grandma, right? So maybe the AI extrapolated that she didn't. She would replicate mm. the stuff. Well, if it's anything like some of the AI stuff we have today, it can Ooh. make up all sorts of weird stuff. So that yeah. I'm sure it's a little be... bit better. Yeah. <laughs> in the 32nd century. I hope. I hope. I guess. I guess. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't think of that as like him getting a. A, what would we call a memory scan or something and then getting turned into a hologram I, I read it as it was being like a live scan so it would okay. react in the moment right but yeah that was my assumption okay yeah. well you, that's I pretty totally cool though. go that deep it is and and he was talking about using it as a, a a means for grief therapy and i i don't know how i feel about that yeah because i kind of feel like that would be just making it so that the person still there whenever you want them to be and you're not actually dealing with it 
but you know, maybe that's I mean, just I lost me. my mom about two years ago and what I want to have a conversation with a version of her. But what if someone does have issues they need to resolve with someone who's that's true. no longer alive that they can't resolve. And that might be a, a healthy way to get past a block. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, even Pike said he wanted to go get on a boat and have a quote conversation with his dad. Right. In mm-hmm. um, those old scientists. So yeah, I don't know. It's interesting for sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure how healthy or not. I, I, I imagine, as with most things, it can be healthy or mm-hmm. it can be unhealthy, depending yeah. on the application and the person. Yeah. Yeah. You have a, a Barkley situation where you just have a holodeck full of all of or, dead or did Or did Jake create a hologram of his dad? Because his dad didn't actually mm. die. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so how do you mourn? And then he gets, like, stuck visiting his holographic dad you know and quirks yeah yeah it it could be dangerous no but it's it is an interesting idea either way and it does get us to the point of um he he is reminded to look at the the scientific and the physical before he starts Mm -hmm. looking for something beyond that um Uh which is something you know i think we all have moments in our life where what should be so obvious is the last thing we think of. There's a um, a YouTube gamer that I uh, used to watch. He played Mario uh, Mario Maker all the time. His name was Dashy, and uh, and there was one thing he he occasionally got un, unintentionally profound, and he says sometimes the easiest solution is the last thing on your mind. And I I mm. actually like I I made a little put that on a piece of paper and stuck it on my office door because it's so true. You know, yeah. for him, it was trying to figure out how to get to the end of the level. But it's just, you'd think that would be the first place where he'd go. But it wasn't. So that was a, a nice way to get to that point. Mm-hmm. I really like that this scene, too, picks up on the, let's carefully think methodically through a problem. Mm-hmm. Just like we saw with Stamets, Tilly, and Michael. We have A and B story are the crew are just thinking through their problems. Yes. Very Trek. Here's mm-hmm. a solution. We just have to find it. Um, so uh, just because Culver's like on the side of, of the larger story. So just to mm-hmm. go through what goes on there. Um, he, he goes, he's going to talk to Paul and help him, ask him to help him run a neural scan. Um, which makes Paul very concerned, of course, as as you can understand that. Mm-hmm. On the way, he runs into Book, and Book's twitchy and wants something to do, and that's a that's a feeling I know well, because <laughs> you're like, oh, I have time to do nothing, and I don't know how to do that. Um, so he recommends that he relax so that he can be ready when he's needed again, and that's a, always a good thing to remember. Um, the neural scan comes up clean. And Culver is maybe more confused than before because I think he really kind of set his hat on, oh, maybe there's something weird going on in my head now. Um, But Paul, who is incredibly not spiritual, says, well, if you know that there's nothing wrong with you, go with it. Enjoy it, which I think is not a bad bit of advice. And Paul's like, he clearly places this experience in the the realm of the material. Cause he's mm-hmm. like all the connections of the billions of neurons and the yep. thousands of connections between them saying the outcome of all those connections is creating this feeling, right? Yeah. Not, not a spiritual thing. Yeah. Or the spiritual experience is a result of those physical um, connections. Yeah. Which I think is a, is a really, that's not a new idea by any means, but mm-hmm. it's a, mm-hmm. it's an interesting way to look at it. But I do love how supportive he's being. Yeah. And, you know, there's no like, come on, man. This religious stuff, what? Yeah. Right. But he clearly puts it in the camp of materialism. Mm -hmm. Which is is very Trek and, you know, gets into Mm -hmm. shadows, the other part of the story, I suppose you could say. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. The thing that book was book mentioned 
how humans have this thing about thinking that things aren't important if they're only for themselves. Yeah. Which was both, I felt was, was quite profound, but at the same time, I think is only part of the human condition. It's, it's maybe the humans he's run into who are not selfish, Mm -hmm. but. Well, think about it this way. Like growing up, I was the only Star Trek fan that I knew. Mm Mm-hmm. Besides my family, and, and it, now it's like even better because I get to share it, although it's mediated through you know mm-hmm. social media and stuff or or a mm-hmm. podcast, <laughs> so it becomes more special. But was it less special back then when it was just me? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we just like to share things. Or uh, I think that's it. Uh, that is the human experience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're very. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Social. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you yes i suppose that is the word i was looking for i was trying to think of like a pack animal thing that's what i was trying to say but just herd, herd mentality herd, yeah. herds yes we run tribal in herds. tribal <laughs> all of those things okay good compare chrissy yes as you know anthropologist is not working in my head today <laughs> they took the xeno out of you yeah yeah <laughs> Zeno anthropologist first of all I, I think I've talked about makes this no before sense. it makes no sense because yeah. it's unless you're, you're studying human cultures on other planets in which then that makes sense but okay so it does make sense on Stargate yes ah, yeah. <laughs> so off to the planet we go where they learn the whistle speak uh, or where they speak with the whistle speak um Dr. Creel set up a bunch of weather towers. Five, as a matter of fact. Um, Michael just kind of waxes poetic about the anthropological elements of this, which I absolutely love. And I love how Tilly's yeah. like, hey, you want to come teach? Like, okay, maybe. Maybe you get that impression. We might see... Uh, some foreshadowing there for yeah. what's happening on uh, the Academy show. Yeah. Special guest lecturer. Guest yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so they get all this awesome technology, including tricorders on their eyeballs. That's cool. awesome. Like, wow. Okay. Um, and they go join a group of pilgrims and they all call themselves compeers, um, mm-hmm. which, uh, which I was thinking comrade peers, but then Chris looked it up and it's a French derivation. And now I can't remember what you said. Late 14th century old French compare. I can't speak French. Sorry. It's a friendly compare. greeting, which means friend, brother, or, you know, the C O M com means with mm-hmm. and Latin. peer means equal. So that okay. makes sense because their language doesn't see social status. Right. Yeah. And so that, that term really uh, supported that idea, which was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. I'm glad they didn't, use something that was familiar like comrade uh, it would be compare yeah. in french by the way okay thank you i, just yes. it up. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure how it's spelled i had to look it up but yeah compare <laughs> yes which is interestingly in modern french means godfather yes hmm. saw that yeah and derived from uh the latin potter so mm-hmm. oh mm-hmm Lest we turn this into a linguistics podcast, so I think it's appropriate because yeah. Michael goes full linguistic. You know, there my brain was like, "Hoshi would love this." Oh, yeah. <laughs> the thing I love the thing with the whistles because it reminded me of whales, right? Yeah, it's mm. it's a type of sound that's being produced that can go long distances without amplification, and it's just it's so cool. And it's beautiful too. Mm-hmm. It was really cool and mm-hmm. poetic. It, the formalized way of speaking, which was just something unique we haven't seen in Star Trek, which is amazing that a series can do something that we haven't seen before. Yeah. Yeah. All the more reason to that. I'm sad that this is the last season and I keep saying that too. So, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So they run into this other group of pilgrims and they are uh, apparently like two minutes away from where they were headed. Cause by the time they're done having a conversation about who they are, they're there. Uh, which is a good thing because uh, the, I don't know if she was the leader of the group, but the woman that they were talking to, who we found out later is named Anora. Um, 
has uh, lung damage from being out in the dust. Um, For an entire night, breathing dust yeah. just sounds horrible. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting. Did you get, did you get the impression that they were going to fix the other towers or maybe send somebody to fix the other towers? No, it didn't sound like they were, which Mm -hmm. I thought was weird. Like you'd Mm -hmm. think they would, Mm -hmm. especially assuming all they need is the maintenance that they could show the people. I would have thought they would set up the other towers. Yeah. Maybe the other ones need more repair than that. Maybe they were damaged by the sandstorms over time and the, the uh, core of engine Starfleet engineering will come. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Right. Or second contact. Yes. Uh, an advanced uh, California class will come. Yes. <laughs> Cerritos F or something. Yeah. Um, it would be F for Cerritos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wasn't even going there, but yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, so she's got this cough and they, they fix it with, this sonic ritual, which I, I don't know if that's a good way to put it, but it seemed to make sense to me. It was awesome. Particularly because yeah, it right ahead of it. does make sense. Um, yeah, because Tilly mentions about some something sonic could take a yeah. could deal with it. And then that's exactly percussion, what they do. Sonic percussion or something yes, like that. Yes, yeah. that's yeah. it. And I assume the the point is the dust has sort of packed itself in the lungs and yeah. the, the sounds loosens it so that it can be coughed up. Yeah. Which... Yeah. I am not a doctor, but it sounds plausible to me. Well, and you saw it doing that to sand in the candles and stuff like Mm -hmm, that. mm -hmm. Like you saw its effect. So that was really cool and surprising and unique again. Mm -hmm. Good Star Trek going on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, And in the process of that ritual, they meet, well, they meet Rava because she brings, or they bring them to the, uh, the place at the, bottom of the mountain i guess um mm-hmm. and then ovaz is the one who performs the ritual they find out about the other towers and they just need to find the control panel to fix it and we learn just enough about the journey of the mother compere mm-hmm. just enough that we don't actually know what's happening what do you guys think about this like did you suspect that it was a, a death race from the get-go, or what? No, I didn't. Mm-mm. No, neither did no, I. No, I, I had the same reaction as Tilly did. Yep. Sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. All right. Um. And on the on second watch, I wasn't sure if Rava knew it either. Um, but I think I she think did. She did. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Because on third watch, I'm like, no, that she did, and I think, and and Anora is the same because she's talking about her friend, and who won, who won, and she just talks about how I wonder what it would be like to be, you know, old and wrinkled together. But that doesn't necessarily mean she died because of the race, you know. So right. you don't catch that the first time, and I think that was really good writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why Michael's like. She knows something is being said to her that she needs to consider, but she's not mm-hmm. sure what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because Tilly asks if she's okay. She's like, mm, I think, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe. Um, but I do like how the mother compares story is just they're trying to understand how everything's working and are seeing conveniences and creating a whole mythology out of it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a, I mean, the story in itself is, is one of those, like so many myths about, you know, the, you, mm-hmm. somebody sacrificing themselves to save their children or whoever, um, or sacrificing, not necessarily fully sacrificing themselves, but um, sacrificing something. Uh, How did you all feel about yeah. the the ingesting of the little white cubes as they're doing, I'm like, don't do that. Scan it first. <laughs> like, yeah. <please. laughs> yes. I, I really wonder what the heck that is that it like can just eating that. Like it was like a little square of paper basically that they put on their tongue and Salt? it suddenly dries out know. their whole mouth. Yeah. So yeah. Whenever we have 
members of our crew who go somewhere and they don't know, they've never been there before, no humans have ever been there before, and they eat something, I just want to scream at them. Yes. Like, <laughs> don't do that. But it was well conceived. I really liked the yes. um, the whole idea of the race and being thirsty and being tempted. There's bowls of water the whole way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. And then the uh, last I mean, two racers having to hold the water as they go. Really well thought out. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. It um, it felt very um, capital C Catholic to me. <laughs> yes. In a lot yes. of ways. Punish yourself. <laughs> Here we're gonna sacrifice. You have to sacrifice something, and uh, and here's some guilt on top of it as well. If you can't actually make it to the end while you're holding the water, uh, <laughs> uh, recovering Catholicism. Okay, um, but yeah, it was it was cool. I one of the things I liked most about it in the moment was we have that wonderful parallel of from the first season when Michael was helping Tilly in her training and here they are, they're running this race. And I just, it's not the kind of thing I expected a call back to, but then there it is. And you're like, Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And Tilly was uh, doing better than Michael was. (laughs) Yes. Like when Michael has to rest, Tilly's like just running around her. She's not going to stop. See, that's, the, that's the captain. Captain doesn't have to run around as much. You had to run around <laughs> a lot to get there, but then once you're there. I I did like the whole body in motion thing, though. I think she's right about that, yes. because I think if she had stopped, because the moment she does stop, when she seems to have that, like, I don't know, moment yeah. of, of lightheadedness or whatever. But, uh, yeah, that was that was nicely done. Uh, so then we get, we figure out the control panel or where the control panel is because of irradiated moss. I joined Starfleet to scan moss. <laughs> like, I had, to, had to drop that, that in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how does she know, you know, that there isn't just, it's just, you know, it's blue on that side of the, you know ridge or something i just again it's that jump that i no, I, she's a question. scientist making a hypothesis hypothesis right actually that's, that's true that's she doesn't know what episode is so... also like us going immediately to radiation was interesting to me because i would think it could just as easily be something leaking from the not that's not radioactive but some mm-hmm. other chemical that's causing it to be like uh i mean we have plants that are different colors depending on the acidity of the soil. Mm-hmm. So, like, again, yeah. hypothesis. Yeah, and she turned yeah. out to be right. Mm-hmm. So, don't think too hard. Again, I like their thinking I, through things. I will say, looking at this planet, not the yellow moss, but like with the turquoise leaves and like the reddish dirt, I keep thinking, oh, I should be wearing three D glasses when watching this, because it looks like. The sort of th- the sort of thing that you would have where you have those red and the red and blue three D glasses. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, on, on, I was trying to think of. On a related this note. is referencing something that I haven't seen. <laughs> it looks like something. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. On Sorry. a related note, I just love all the outdoor shoots that we get this season. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. really fun. Mm-hmm. Well, it's uh, again. Harkening back to Stargate to save I... money, they're just going to the local forest and shooting. Mm-hmm. In Canada, <laughs> just put some blue over here, and you know this is over there, and yeah, they have oak trees on all planets. That's just it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Oak and maple trees. Yeah, and I in this case, it's just a regular forest that they're post production changing oh, yeah. the colors. Yeah. yeah, this is pretty cool though. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it makes sense. Any humanoid life that comes from their progenitors need that's oxygen true. and tr- mm-hmm. are, you know, mm-hmm. all that. So we're all related. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love that Discovery has just bought in on this whole design oh, yeah. aesthetic of an alien species with just some marks on their head. Not even prosthetics, just mm-hmm. like pencil mark on their head. 
just it's it's full TOS. Like it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's part of Star Trek, and I love it. It works very well. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially in the context of the progenitor storyline. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but, but, right. So Michael drops out. She figures out the control panel. Um, she scans it with her eyeball tricorder and uh, sends it <laughs> up to Adira, who is very nervous about being on the bridge. Uh, but they seem to have figured out what they needed to do uh, uh-huh. to get comfortable with it, and and talks her uh, talks Michael through fixing the control panel. So. I like that we find we we learned just through the a quick aside there that they had asked Rainer for more time on the bridge and he was just like yeah go yeah. for it yeah which is reasserting again that's the first officer's job is you know mm-hmm. crew assignments so that makes perfect sense and and also the whole thing about they're being very concerned because they brought the bug on and they didn't know it mm-hmm. and it's not their fault and everybody's telling Adira that but you know so Michael figures out how to fix the the control panel or with Adira. Mm-hmm. And then we end up with Tilly and Rava as the last of the racers. And Rava drops her water, but Tilly then gives her some of her water, gives them some of her water so that they can all finish the race. The two of them can finish the race yeah. together. I that was a I didn't say that very well, but okay. Um that's a standard trope in oh yeah movies and TV shows and whatnot. So that part I expected. Mm-hmm. It was beautifully done. I think if we had gotten a little more of Ovaz watching it happen, mm-hmm. because because there could have been that moment of like oh, you know yeah thank God Relief, she's, yeah. you know on his the, part they're not gonna die and then and then it's like no no um. Yeah. So then we find out that um, the vacuum chamber that created the rain uh, got turned into a, a sacrificial vault. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm sure it happened. I'm sure it happened accidentally one time. They had an issue. Rain wasn't happening. So they sent someone up there. And then just by sure coincidence, it started raining after that. Oh, maybe. maybe in the Or like, something like that. The mechanism went into effect when they were in there and then it was right oh and see here i was thinking you know did this probably started maliciously but i don't think so i don't think so because the story the mother compare she she sacrificed herself to bring water to others and then later generations like oh it's not raining we need to find a way to sacrifice ourselves yeah so Mm. the rain will come but we're not violent people so we're not just gonna like burn you at the stake or whatever, but go up here and you can suffocate uh, without yeah, anyone being able to fine. see or hear you. That That's good. That's better. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's, it's the lucky chosen, the honorable ones, right? I, mm-hmm. I feel like they call them the chosen ones or something. When Michael asks if she can go yeah. in, in, yeah. In retrospect, the fact that you have to win a race, like, kind of makes it worse because these people are going to last longer deprived of oxygen because they're they're going to have better um uh uh circulatory systems from running that race or, uh, yeah. they were able to win the race they're the kind of person they're whose healthy. heart rate is going to be slower etc cetera, etc cetera. or they're so exhausted and worn out from the race it's they need to rest or just go to sleep and it's a nice relief <laughs> that that's yeah, yours is a better thought say. yeah <laughs> That's why they do it right away. If they waited, you know, till yeah. the next day, then it would not work as mm. well. My thing, though, as they're in that chamber, I'm like, blow out the fires. It's eating your mm-hmm. oxygen. <laughs> Get rid of the yeah. fires. But I did like that the fires were getting smaller. Also, the flame were getting smaller as time was going on. Yeah. That was a smart production. I didn't notice that. Oh, that's mm-hmm. a nice little mm-hmm. bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they are, they're stuck in this vacuum chamber, uh, and they are supposed to pray next to this wall that has numbers on it, because that's going to help people remember the prayers, and they figure out that that's actually what's scratched on the water vial. And Burnham, as we said earlier, says to hell with the Prime Directive, goes in and saves their lives, 
hopefully ends the sacrifices. Yeah, seems like that probably will happen. Yeah. An interesting conversation, though, where Ovaz mm -hmm. is worried yes. that it'll disrupt society mm -hmm. um, and that the sacrifices bring them all together. But I, I don't buy it because there was no indication that there was any tension or any strife in society. Everyone's very friendly and helpful with each other that we saw, at least, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so... It's, it, he made it sound like these are the hunger games, basically <laughs> that yes. this is what keeps the society together. But I guess within the time constraints of the story, we didn't get to see any of that kind of tension. In Star if this was Stargate, we would have that one guy in the mm -hmm. crowd. That's like, Hey, we can't stop. You know, that that's a dissenter, but um, we didn't He's... get that here. Yeah. And he says that earlier attempts to end the sacrifices were met with violence which doesn't make sense it's a mm -hmm. it's an almost throwaway line except for the fact that they had earlier established that it seems to be such a peaceful society so mm -hmm. that was kind of odd to me but yeah and sacrifice is a violence right um so trading one violence for another you know yeah yeah i suppose People perceive things but differently was... if they're not seeing them and there's no blood. Yes. Yeah. You were I do appreciate Michael's statements about how um, there's the story of the mother compare and there's also us. So we yes. haven't taken your beliefs away. Um, we've just added to that. And now you have to wrestle with what that all means for yourselves. Um, it's that interesting balancing line uh, act that Star Trek does with uh, faith and and science i guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's the the idea of the the morality tale is is valid irrelevant to the source you know, yeah whether it's the gods it's, or merely yeah, the, yeah when michael's this is nothing i've nothing i've revealed to you disproves the mm -hmm. gods yeah and that's it it reminds me a lot of uh ds9 where yeah, yeah. To Starfleet, the prophets are the wormhole aliens, and to the Bajorans, they're the prophets. And they're both just because they're aliens doesn't necessarily mean that they can't also be. Yeah, they're outside of time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this also made me think about the Mintakins. Yes. The card. Oh, yeah. But also yes. last night, I put on the Omega Directive and Seven's okay, story yeah. about uh, having a spiritual experience at the end with Janeway. Mm -hmm. Um, so Star Trek has these moments where they're like, and even Picard in early, early TNG, when he, I think Data asked what's after life, I forget the exact conversation, but Picard's like, we don't know. Yeah. And we'll cool. We'll cool. We're cool with that. There might be nothing. There might be something. Um, I think that's the one with the big green frog face. Can't think of the name. Yeah. Of if it is that one, I don't watch that one least. too often. <laughs> Yes. Nagilum, I think. Yes, Nagilum. Yes. It's a blue or silvery face. That's the bags of mostly water? No, no that's home that's soil. Different. Home soil. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I was thought Nagilum was Obviously, green. Obviously, I need to do an early TNG rewatch. Oh, I think no, maybe silver? Fine. Nagilum might be silver. Now I gotta look, because maybe it was <laughs> my bad TV first time I watched it's it. It's silver, I think, um, but I I always think of it as blue because my nephew had a toy that had a face on it that looked just like Nagilum, but it was blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm looking at... I'm, I'm seeing some green, but maybe it's just me. But regardless, it, it is yes. very okay, interesting. It's like a silvery green. I'll, can we agree on that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was just going to say I don't see colors well, so that's fine. Okay. Regardless, it's like interesting something. that um, Star Trek, after all these decades, is still taking this kind of respectful, middle-of-the-road kind of stance, and it's not going pure, hard sci-fi, um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which makes it pretty different um, in the sci-fi world, I think. Um, yeah. 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 But, I mean, as a religious person myself, I find that interesting and respectful. It's not that it's claiming you know Christianity is a thing, but it's just hey, spirituality is part of the human condition. 
and we're going to recognize it occasionally on mm -hmm. on episodes whatever that might mean to the viewer mm -hmm. yeah i i think pretty similar to how they handled it with new eden as well yeah yeah Although we know exactly what the Red Angel was in New Eden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No mystery there. That's true. Yeah, there is that. Another mother. But, you know, sent by the gods, maybe. You never know. Uh, all right. And uh, when we get back up to Discovery, we find out that uh, Maul and Locke have been found. And we have the clue. And it had a metal card with it that has some writing on it. And uh, on writing. to the next, on to the next thing. Yes. This was I a very Trek episode. Really, very, very Trek. It was very Trek, very Stargate SG-1. I really love <laughs> the final conversation between Tilly and Michael, though, about mm -hmm. yeah. this is very Star Trek, very old school Star Trek, where they discuss what the lesson of the episode is, that you need to respect yes. technology. Mm -hmm. It's a great responsibility. And I think that's a big thing that, like, myself included, had issues, not issues, but it was a lot to take in in early discovery where the lesson wasn't spelled out for us, right? And the philosophical mm -hmm. ideas weren't spelled out for us. We had to mine it from the stories. Um, but sometimes it's nice to just have the characters learn the things with us and, and talk through that. And that was a yeah. nice touch to this episode. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that's a nice touch right now for what's going on in society, particularly with with AI. It can, yeah. it can be useful, it can be dangerous. Very tried and did not make that connection. So could this grief therapy technology, AI, does that come back as some kind of a thing that could be Ooh. good, but also bad if we're not using it well? Well, I think anything can be good or, or yeah. bad, depending on how you use it. Yeah, that was kind of what we were saying earlier, but mm -hmm. I didn't go there with that. I was just going to, I just got done with winter semester exams. So that's all I was going <laughs> with. <it. laughs> oh, yeah, fun. Well, anything else we want to discuss with this episode? Uh, the replicated mafongo that uh mm. oh gods yeah the very end well and also yeah. book admitting he loves michael still and mm -hmm. and colber asking do you think you can get it back and obviously that's setting up something and i hope that yes it sets up what i want it to be mm -hmm. <laughs> which they get back together so i like that friendship what do you guys think about that colber um and book friendship. I, I like it too, yeah. Me too. Yeah, it's... It was an unexpected pairing, mm -hmm. but it makes it makes sense. I like it. Also, that mofongo looks delicious. Oh, it does. Okay, I have I meant to look this up. What is that? It's amazing. I've only had it once, and uh, the restaurant <laughs> I had it in, I'm like, I gotta go back here all the time, and then the restaurant closed. <laughs> so... Isn't that the way? Yep. It's a traditional Puerto Rican dish. I've actually only had it once, too. Actually, in a restaurant in San Juan. Uh, oh. And, yeah. Star Trek Cruise? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have only ever been to Caribbean locations um, because of the Star Trek Cruise. Yes. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that, is. that is. Jealous. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's uh, fried plantains uh, mashed mm. together with olive oil and garlic and mm. bacon. And then you put other things on it. In this case, uh, con it was con pollo al uh, chicken. Uh, gio? Yes. So, which is which is chicken with garlic sauce. Huh? It's just so incredibly satisfying dish. Mm-hmm. I'll You're full it. afterwards, but it's oh, yeah. just like, oh. That makes me sad, though, because mm. I can't eat it because I'm it's... allergic to bananas and plantains. Oh, oh that's a no. Shame. Bad. Oh, yeah, because well. I mean, as I said, it, it's made with with uh, with bacon uh, or uh, it's it's made with bacon or, or pork, pork rinds. Like, so there's bacon yeah. fat in it. So oh. like mm. it tastes 
like so you get that that flavor throughout the whole thing oh it's so good it's amazing <laughs> that's awesome all right well uh i need to look up if there's a puerto rican restaurant anywhere nearby there you go. There you go. <laughs> You're near enough major metropolis met metropolises. I'm sure there's one somewhere. Well, I'm sure there is one within a few hours. I meant one that I could. Just, yeah, that's like, what I I, I meant. From. Yeah, I didn't mean. <laughs> no, no, we can get dinner tonight. So I mean, if you're talking within a few the... hours, you can go to New York and you'll be set. Right. <laughs> anyway, bring it back to the yes. episode for a moment. I yes. You know, I do an enterprise podcast, and we always talk about mm -hmm. the food. And there's a lot of food in enterprise, and oh, people yeah. eating. And mm -hmm. it is nice to have that kind of moment um, in mm -hmm. Discovery, too, because we don't get a ton of that. Um, so this was just a great moment and using that shuttle set, which is pretty cool. I mean, Book is just playing mm -hmm. video games, essentially, <laughs> which is neat. Yeah. Um, Asteroids, but, basically. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is literally a Bofongo restaurant in Harrisburg. Ooh. Well, we know what Thad's having for dinner. Yeah, it's called Mission Mofongo. Wow. <laughs> you know exactly cool. where you're going to get there. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> anyway. No mysteries. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know what you mean about the food. I miss seeing uh, the the relationships around food when it's not yes. there. I don't, you know, it's like I don't think about it until somebody brings it up or you see it. And it's like, yeah, that's, it's such a huge part of life and the sharing of food and the breaking of bread and you know, going from communion, from the, the actual, you know, the, the, the literalness of it to the spiritual concept of the breaking of bread as well. So it's just, uh, there's a good way to end the episode that I hadn't even thought of. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, anything else we want to say on this? <laughs> you know, I need to watch it more. And think about what does the water mean symbolically? Because water, and especially yeah. in the Christian religion, is significant. Mm -hmm. um, communion, you know, uh, food. Yeah. And why, why, why is whistle speak the title? Because it just plays a very tiny portion of it. Um, I think yeah. because it's a cool word. Yeah, it is. But I'm wondering if there's anything else that um, can connect to what we're talking about. So, They're trying know. to bring in confused Bridgerton watchers who think that it says Lady Whistledown. <laughs> Maybe. <I don't> know. <laughs> I'll take that. I don't know. <laughs> you, you, uh, you prompted a thought, though. The um, Okay, so this, this clue had water in it. Mm -hmm. The next clue has metal. Or we mm -hmm. assume, since there's a metal card. Um mm -hmm. The first clue was kind of in the ground. Everything's going to change once the Fire Nation attacks. I was just going to say, then they find Rava, and the Rava joins with the Avatar. <laughs> and then, yeah, and the 10,000 yeah, cycles. Yeah. <laughs> and Paramount is not going to, like, yeah, do a crossover between two of their franchises, Dude. and we're going to get Star Trek Avatar. Star Trek Avatar in the holodeck. I'll do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> sure. If y'all haven't seen the Avatar or the Legend of Korra, get it, get on it. It's it's pretty incredible. It's on the list, but mm -hmm. I remember like shelving those when they came out in the early aughts, and so it's one of those I have, things like, oh, oh, Abby's gonna start it this summer. She says so yeah, uh, from first. Yeah, that was podcast. one of the things that I, I I had avoided for a long time, but I I binged it during the pandemic a few years ago and yeah it, uh avatar is fantastic it also has um it has a lot of star trek voice actors in it uh mm -hmm. jason isaacs george takei george takei yeah. Cool. yeah very cool all right well <laughs> so and with a plug for avatar another paramount yeah, yeah, franchise you know, hey <laughs> give the paramount more, money so that we get more star trek the there more you, you watch on paramount plus just turn it on during the day and let it go leave it for your pet to watch while you're at work it's all good well it's interesting because paramount is devoting like making their own studio and a huger franchise for avatar like they've been doing with star trek 
Um, mm. So it hopefully both are remain healthy in whatever mm. company takes over Paramount. <laughs> yeah. Um, to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. Oh well. I think okay. uh, that covers most everything. Yeah. That was a fantastic episode of Star Trek. Possibly my favorite of the season. Wow. Definitely. Yeah, I loved it. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I don't right. think it beats for me Face the Strange, but that Face one the Strange is, is also excellent. really good. <laughs> different good for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Compere Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, where can listeners find you online? And uh, what work would you like to mention? No, thank you guys for having me. I, I felt seen being requested to talk about the religious episode, so I appreciate okay, that. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, people can find me on the First Flight podcast with my co-host, Abby M. Summer, who is a regular discusser of Little House in the Prairie on this here <laughs> podcast. Yes, she is. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of my wife's favorite series, so that, that's always fun. Um, and yeah, uh, you can also find me on my YouTube channel, Completing the Shelf, where I talk about Star Trek, Star Wars, Disney, things like that. And I'm on Twitter or X, at Shelf Nerds, tweeting away about Star Trek. Yes, still enjoying... Your micro treks going back and forth. Oh, yeah. They've dried up a little bit. I've been, been busy, well, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just still there. This part of Picard from in my head. All right. Well, uh, Thad, where can people find you when you're not looking to ingesting the, random the, 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 cubes? Yeah, I was I was trying to think of a way to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Thad, where can people find you when you're not uh, about to run a race and you just eat the thing that gets handed to you? <laughs> <laughs> I am unlikely to do either of those things, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, best place to find me is on Twitter. I am at Tyrannicus. That's T Y R A N I C U S. I am also under that handle on most of the other social networks. Uh, and you can hear me on the podcast I do with my friend Carl called License to Spiel. That's License spelled with a C, like the British do it, where we started out talking about James Bond and now we talk about other movies and shows that we watch. Chrissy, where can people find you when you're not uh, trying to perfect one of your grandmother's recipes? I, that's actually something that I've done. I've or not not perfected it, but you know, tried to cook my grandmother's yeah, recipes. Yeah. So that's cool. All right. Well, uh, in addition to here on Infinite Diversity, you can find me on History with the Zoggies here on the BQN, uh, that uh, twice weekly short history podcast I do with my fellow historian partner Jason. I'm also happy to chat about our shows in the BQN Collective on Facebook and in our Discord server, which is uh, very busy lately. And I'm also on Twitter and Blue Sky at the Goddess Livia. That's T-H-E-G-O-D-D-E-S-S-L-I-V-I-A, where you can see my opinions about Star Trek history and leftist politics. Don't forget all our other shows on BQN. Here's Amy Nelson to tell you all about them. What shows are on BQN, you ask? Well, here's a rundown of some podcasts you might be interested in. All Good Things, a Star Trek Universe podcast covering all of Trek, hosted by Amy, Mark, Christos, Kelvin, and Kristen. Whether you've got Xbox or Nintendo, check out Bargain Bin Gamer, a YouTube show hosted by Davey, a self-proclaimed gamer who specializes in reviewing and showcasing affordable video games. Two episodes enter the arena, one comes out victorious. Join hosts Joe and Kevin, and a guest, as they debate which should win the Batleth battle. Grab your popcorn as you listen to Cinema Z, a film discussion and review podcast showcasing films you probably missed, but should definitely check out. Hosted by Mark and Matt. Don your apron for The Food Replicator, where Matthew eats and drinks his way through the Star Trek cocktail and three cookbooks. Beam Aboard Galaxy Class, a Star Trek Next Generation podcast covering all of TNG, hosted by Steven. In order to not repeat it, listen to History with the Zalogis, a snippet of historical events from around the world, hosted by Chrissy and Jason. For the newest Trek coverage, check out Infinite Diversity, hosted by Chrissy and Thad. 
Curl up with a good book and delve into Beta Canon with Peter, host of the online Trek Book Club on Twitter and his new companion Trek Book Club podcast. Test your Trek knowledge with Trexpert's Quiz, a Star Trek quiz show hosted and written by Davey. Whether you're a member of Starfleet Federation or Planetary Union, go check out Union Federation, covering current Star Trek and the Orville, which we all know is really a Trek show, hosted by Kyle, Kevin, Amy, and Haley. Head over to YouTube and watch the view screen live on Sundays, your Trek-inspired talk show hosted by Calvin and Amy, with Season 2 starting in September for a 10-week run. Spill the tea with Christos while he discusses current Trek news and events and explores the world of fandom via guest interviews, all with a LGBTQIA plus perspective on what's the tea about. And for our Patreon members, we have the Hive Mind with monthly script readings. Let's Fly, a Discovery Reaction Show. It's Green, a cornucopia of topics. Amy's Math Moments, a quick look at math moments in Star Trek. We know you have a choice of podcasts to choose from, and we thank you for listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. So thank you so much for tuning into Infinite Diversity. Thank you to Zach Tripp for the wonderful theme music and Mark White for the awesome short. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast player, and don't forget to rate and review us there as well. If you want to reach out, you can find the network on Twitter at BQN Podcasts or our show specifically at Idic Podcast. You can also talk about any and all of the BQN Podcasts in our Facebook group, the BQN Collective, and on our Discord server. When you next hear from us, we'll be talking about the Discovery episode, Erica. Until then, peace and long life.